again. Okay, so uh, we're day uh, five, I think, out or something. It's the 25th, sounds about right. Um, still going upwind, <laughs> which uh, as I have set myself a task of sailing solo non-stop west around the world, it's probably good training. It's not exactly what I would have chosen uh, with the rig being uh, in the state it's in, but um, it's holding up to it. I keep checking and rechecking everything. Um, we have had one uh, sadness in the story, which is that the mainsail is uh, the mainsail is pooched. Um, the method of construction for that is where the manufacturer um, spreads aramid fibers across um, a, across a three-dimensional mold, and the three-dimensional mold can be inflated in little pocketed cells. And then once the aramid fibers are laid on in exactly the place that the design and the computer says where it needs to go, they will hold the, uh, the loads on the sail down those lines. And it is then sandwiched together uh, between either two clear layers, where it's going on a racing boat, or in this, uh, this situation, between two white taffeta layers. Um, and it means you get a sail which is very, very light. It only has strength exactly where it needs it. Um, it's very light compared to other kinds of sails, although as we know they're very heavy on this boat. But um, it's light and it holds great shape and it's made all in one piece. The downside of it is that what happens in the end is that they delaminate, which is that the two taffeta pieces or the two clear plastic laminates, uh, the glue starts to come apart uh, with UV damage and then they release and when they release just the aramid fibers are left. you just got this crazy mass of, um, of, of of wild aramid fibers. Maybe it was 40 minutes going on deck. I'm saying that to say it had a bit of a period of time um, to go from go from what it was, which was it looked okay if you were standing way back, but obviously with any kind of scrutiny, you could see that the, it was badly dim and laminated. Well, obviously one of the taffeta edges ripped and the whole lot cleaned itself out in uh, 30 odd, 40 odd minutes. So that's the end of that. So we're... Well, hello once again. Well, it's been, uh, it's been a couple of days since I last filmed. Um, we're pretty much exactly, no, we're in the, right in the middle of our trip. We are more to the west side now of the Atlantic. It's uh, the 27th, 28th, 28th. So we've been at sea for six days. So in terms of a 12 day journey time, which is what I wanted, we're, we're looking just fine. Um, we do have one problem. Okay, so we know uh, we spoke about this before, the, the main is delaminated. So, uh, the main now is here. <laughs> now, anybody that knows these boats or knows this kind of setup will be going, oh? Yes, the main is off here and is now, I, shall, I feel like a magician. Here we go, and the beautiful Debbie McGee showing us that the main is indeed not in the boom bag anymore and is down here. So, I am filmed because I guess I was a little bit exasperated. Uh, um, you know, it was hard work putting the main up and we didn't have the right battens. And then um, we were very lucky Antoine had, was a friend in uh, Cherbourg, had an old set of fiberglass uh, 28 mil uh, round stock. So he was able to give us to those. They're sitting on the bow, just on the port and on the starboard. The difference is the ones that are on the port side are the ones which were the spares from the original job and the ones to starboard are the battens out of the now old mainsail. You just close the forward hatch. Never leave hatches open. I was airing the uh, boat. I am airing the boat. Okay, so these are the battens. Hey, stay tall, go away. Okay, these are the battens down here out of the main. So getting, uh, getting the main off a boat like this at sea is, uh, is no small undertaking. Um, I did it last night i kind of was thinking is this a, a message from the gods you know get the mainsail down and the rigs in jeopardy and then i looked at the weather and there's a big light patch ahead of us here it is so i knew that the light patch would be the right time to put the mainsail up so i needed to take it off last night and i took it off in about 20 knots now the boat's running away from that at uh, seven or eight knots with these uh, two headsails up but um still it was uh it wasn't awful. I've actually done a very similar job like that. Um, when I sail around the world in the Velux race, I tore my mainsail 
pretty much at Point Nemo, which is halfway between uh, New Zealand and uh, the tip of South America, Cape Horn. Have you? Um, the good thing for me is that my personal philosophy with this stuff, one of the things that really draws me to the sea, is that whether you're just left the dock 10 miles offshore, a thousand miles offshore, or at Point Nemo, the whole point of this is independence. It, what have you got? What do you need? How you deal with the problem? Um, and the art of separating your reaction to the problem, your emotional reaction to the problem from your problem solving ability. There's no point just sitting in the, in the middle of all this and crying your eyes out, and I've been there. Uh, you, you've got to put that to one side and put the pieces back together again if it and then you've got to get on with problem solving. So although I was in the middle of nowhere, the thought was very much, okay, got to fix this. So it was a six foot rip down the back edge of the mainsail, down the, the leech of the mainsail. And um, I, oh, I'll have a sit down. I have a bit of a Jack and Ori, it's probably safer. Um, so I, uh, I had on board a piece of um, eight inch white. You have to apologize, I, I have to apologize, you don't have to apologize, I have to apologize for the fact that I keep going between metric and standard all the time. So it's great training for anybody who's stuck on one system or the other. The piece of um, material was eight inches wide, but it was about two meters long the rip, okay? So, um, so yeah, so, so it had this huge rip down the back of it and it was a Spectra Dyneema sail, like this one here. So Spectra Dyneema, Spectra Dacron sail. Like this one here. This it's got the strength and the um, form holding abilities of, uh, of more technical fabrics, but you can stitch it back together and that's very important. And it's been a while since uh, there's been sales like that at the top end. Now we're on to 3D I, which is a new kind of almost like felted Dyneema type stuff. It's very similar to Cuban fiber. This is Cuban fiber here on the front edge of the sail. This has been put here as a chafe guard because of this thing. And actually this entire sail <laughs> is Cuban fiber. So this feels like very hard, plasticky kind of to the touch. It's, uh, you can see it's almost like a felted type of thing. If you hear here, it's just starting to get a bit plastic baggy there. And that's where it is a kind of glued laminated type arrangement and it's starting to come apart. And so it should, because this is a 2004 sale. So we'll get some mileage out of it. Yeah, it's gonna be an excellent uh, headsaw for deliveries and all sorts of stuff. This one equally, this is in great condition and this will continue to be in great condition for a long time. It's degraded by UV, not by sitting around. The laminate sails are degraded by sitting around. 3D, 3D L first, uh, with those those composites um, that we saw in the mainsail. There's all these strands of aramid fibers going through it and then these uh, glued on panels on the outside. That comes apart like whether it's time or UV or anything. It's just, it's got a finite lifespan. These, when they're looked after carefully, same as the Cuban fiber, can go on for a very long time. But I don't mind these slightly more basic uh, fabrics because, getting back to the story, I had a Spectra Dacron mix mainsail like this and I was able to stitch it. So I had this two meter long, eight inch wide piece of uh, Cuban fiber actually, that had been left in my sail bag. And um, I was able to stitch it on, but the entire mainsail had to be dropped onto the deck and then I had to kind of spread the back of the mainsail uh, across the boat concertina fashion. And this is thousands of miles from anywhere. It's not thousands of miles into the race, it's thousands of miles from anywhere. Um, and it was super cold, like the water temperature was five degrees Celsius. The temperature on deck was just above freezing. I had a, my big Henry Lloyd, um, like um, one piece of waterproof dry suit. Yeah, it was, it was cold. And the thing was that the stitching I had to do was herringbone stitching. And that Cuban fiber is super tough. So I had to drive the needle through and then use my uh, Gerber to pull the needle out and then make the herringbone stitch. And it took me, um, you know, basically I was doing a foot every hour of good stitching. Um, and there was, I think, do we work out, it was like 30, 30 or 36 feet of stitching to do this. Because it took 36 hours and I'd been in a squall and a storm and a system and uh, had already been awake 24 hours. So I was a bit of a mess by the end of it. Um, but I managed to get the mainsail back up and, um, and get on. And I was 500 miles behind the fleet at that point. I rounded Cape Horn about 110 miles behind the fleet because I was just going all out. There was like, what is the point of being cautious now? Otherwise, I'm just going to be last. Ended up in third position and within 10 miles of the finish, got into second position. And then uh, I came in too close to the shore. I had to jibe twice to get around this little reef. 
and uh, I missed second position by 40 seconds, which uh, at the time, I'm not sure about now, was the closest finish in solo racing history of 40 seconds apart, having raced from Wellington to Punta del Este around Cape Horn, six and a half thousand miles, and that's uh, 40 seconds is the kind of distance you're normally apart at the end of a you know, Sunday afternoon race. So a bit of a bitter pill to swallow at the time, but I must say it only took me five minutes to get over it because I had put everything into it and I was super proud of my performance and I learned heaps about my boat. And drawing all of that background to what's happening now, I had learned about the fact that I can manipulate and work with these sails. Um, so the point today is this mainsail now off, new mainsail or new old mainsail going on. It's in that giant bag at the back and I'm not really particularly looking forward to manu manipulating and moving it. But the other one I'm gonna get it out. Now it doesn't have uh, the cars in it, which is why I kind of unrolled it in Cherbourg and then ugh, had to roll it back up again and get this one out. Um, I know it's a great looking main. I know it's in uh, good condition, but it doesn't have the batten cars at the front. So I'm gonna unpack this bag and we'll maybe look at the delamination when I do that later on get the, the cars out of it and then I'm going to um, look at battens and I've marked all these battens now with their lengths and I'm going to go and get my little notebook and uh, start working out what batten stock we've got and what do we need. The cool thing with this one is that we have this diagram which is the kind of thing you really want to have if you're going to be at sea with sails. On the Clipper race, um, we had just as a kind of, I'm not sure if they intended to give them to us, maybe, they're pretty well thought out. We had this um, plans of our spinnakers and uh, it was it was all the sail, pan the panels in the sail, the actual panel plan of the sails. And it was so useful when we blew up kites because you could um, have this huge mass of um, white dacron inside the boat in this tiny like garden shed type size area that we were trying to do repairs in. And the sails are, you know, the size of a tennis court. But you could start the clue and count up the panels. One, two, three, four, up, find the rip, okay, mark it on the plan, which was laminated. And then go across, three, four, five panels. Oh, yeah, okay, I can see now it goes up again. So then you'd mark, and by the end of it, by feeling your way around this uh, this thing, counting panels up and down, you could draw on the laminated um, panel plan what the damage was. You could see the line up here and then that bit separate from that bit and the clues off and you could get an overview of what's going on. Other, and then everybody in the repair group, which might be 10 people, could understand what they were trying to achieve. Um, and it's the same with this. This doesn't have the, the panel plan, but what a resource, right? I now know that the mainsail, which I've never seen out, has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight battens. Well, that's three more than the mainsail that came off. I know it's got three anti-flutter battens. Okay, and I know that the longest baton is eight, eight, five, seven, oh. So eight, five, seven, oh. Off a quick memory, we do not have a baton. Here's my, uh, should have been a doctor. I know actually my anti-flutter battens are 785 because I, um, I made them all that length thinking that this was the sail I was gonna put up. So that job was not wasted at all. So I've got three 785 flutter battens, I need to, do one addition to a baton of seven centimeters and then I need to do some cutting. So we're gonna make a cut sheet, we're gonna cut the battens and we're gonna fit them to the main and then I think we are in business. All right, so this is the mainsail and we have taken all the baton boxes out bar this one. These two uh, bolts, Allen screws, are, are seized in position. Um, this is the lowest one and you'll normally find it's the lowest gear on the mast that gets seized. Everything else can part very, very well. You can see this yellow stuff here. That's Duralac, that's um, a mating compound which stops uh, stainless steel and aluminum fittings from uh, fizzing, from oxidizing against each other with salt water. The Antal screws, we'll see it better inside, but they have this yellow round here. That's actually a little yellow cone of plastic which again stops the screw head from fizzing. It's a stainless steel screw head, 316 stainless steel screw head against the uh, alloy plate from the um, from the batten box uh, uh, base plate there. So um, they're seized in. I've put some WD-40 on them. Yeah. There's no sand, there's no grit. WD-40 is very useful for a couple of things. The rest of the time we use dry loops and that's that. But as a penetrant in there, the, the, I can see somebody else has been having a go at it because the Allen uh, heads are slightly screwed out uh, or slightly um, 
sheared out. So this sail is basically garbage now, uh, fortunately. We talked about delamination. Um, let's have a see if we can see. Uh, man, I really don't want to have to unzip this entire bag. <laughs> and even this part, which is the like the middle and back of the bag, is super duper heavy. Ugh. Let's see if we. I want to get to a bit where it's. Uh, I don't mind putting some effort in for you. And you too can say, "Wow." <laughs> that main saw's really screwed up. This better be worth it. There better be loads of likes for this. All right, so this is a delaminated 3DL main saw. These are the aramid fibers which used to crisscross through it, like holding all the stress and the strain, holding all of the loads that the sail's exposed to. And then what happens over time, we can see it up here a little bit, is this is taffeta on the outside of this one, but normally it'd be like a clear plastic film. It starts to become disconnected. It's basically glued. This one's glued through to the one on the other side with the aramid fibers in between the two. And depending on the loading of the glue, depends on, I guess, the lifetime of the sail, to be absolutely honest, because once that glue's done, that's it. There's no meat left in the sandwich. The sandwich falls apart. And when the sandwich falls apart, you end up with this off the one side, kind of rip stop taffeta thing here, a bit like a fly sheet of a tent, something like that. And then you get all of the fibers. Yeah. And then you get whatever was on the other side of it. And that's it. So the sail, you know, again, I sh I, uh, if I was a devout YouTuber, then I would, um, of course, have grabbed my, my camera before I grabbed my knife to go and deal with the problem. Maybe one day I'll be that diligent. Uh, not right now though. <laughs>